so let us continue we had done last day we have looked at the maximum number of positions we can uh, reach when we have a, a tree structure so several end effectors and what that gave us is for the overall structure which means you know for each of the end effectors the same number of positions simultaneously solving for all of them but something happens when you have these three structures and it's that you have subgraphs so you can actually create uh, subtrees for less end effectors and those may be solvable for a different number of positions and that may be a problem okay so let's talk about these subgraphs and how those affect the solvability of the whole graph so graphs and graph solvability and when we say solvability we mean that we will be able to perform uh, dimensional synthesis for a, a finite number of positions <laughs> so what is a subgraph for us um, a solvable subgraph is exactly what the name says so a part of a, of a graph that can be solved separately a part of a graph that can be solved separately. When I mean I can be solved, it is, it is solvable. And remember that for the whole graph, when we said it's solvable, we meant that when we calculate the maximum number of positions, we get a positive rational number. If you get infinity or you get a negative number, then it is not solvable by, by exact synthesis. <clears throat> when you have a solvable subgraph, if that requires less position than your total graph, then once you try to solve for the whole graph for more positions, that will become overdetermined and you won't be able to solve it, right? So if if subgraph i and we will we will uh, name the subgraphs uh, and uh, we will enumerate them with an example if subgraph i is solvable for a number of positions mi which is less than m m being the maximum number of positions for the whole graph m equal to equal to maximum number of positions for the whole graph if this happens then when we try to solve for m positions this subgraph will be overdetermined you will have more positions that you will be able to reach then when solving for m graph i is over determined so imagine that you know mi for this subgraph you have four positions at the most the most that you can reach and mi is five as mi means for each of the end effectors that particular end effector that belongs to that subgraph can only reach four instead of five so it won't be able to reach that fifth position you know and then it will be what we call overdetermined. There will be more positions that it can reach. It can only approximate that position, so the whole graph won't be able to uh, be designed for the whole m positions. Okay, so m is not enough. We need to look at the subgraphs too. That's the bottom line. So 
So, we can put some conditions already. Maybe in some cases we won't have any solvable subgraph, right? If if graph does not have proper, and by proper I mean that I discard it, the graph, the whole graph itself, and the null graph, the empty graph. Okay, those are also subgraphs. If you think about it in the mathematical term, we don't consider those. We consider any graph which is smaller than the whole graph. Okay, any subgraph which is not the whole graph. That's what proper means. Proper subgraphs, the set of all subgraphs except the whole graph and the null graph. Okay. So if a graph does not have proper solvable subgraphs, then the graph will be solvable. Because there won't be any part of it that that will be solved for less positions. Okay, when it's not solvable, that means that you know it's it's uh, in fact you you, you have um, you know you can reach any position, right? That's basically what it means. So if it doesn't have proper solvable cell graph, it's solvable. But this is not necessary. This is just a sufficient condition. So if this happens, it is then it is solvable. But for it to be solvable, this doesn't have to happen. Okay. So it's a sufficient but not necessary condition. In order to get the necessary and sufficient condition, we need to actually look at all the subgraphs. Okay. We need to look at all subgraphs to look at all proper subgraphs and then we have to make sure that when you have a subgraph that doesn't become overdetermined. So basically it can be solved for a higher number of positions than the whole graph. We need to look at the all proper subgraphs and check that mi has to be greater than m for all. Okay, and that means mi being a positive rational. Okay, a negative number it doesn't make sense. I mean, what that means is that you can reach many more positions, right? As many as you want. If all of them are solvable with more positions than m, when you define them for m positions, they won't be over over uh, determined. Okay, that's the idea. It's kind of a funny, funny consequence. Okay, but this is what we have to do, and this is what we are going to do with our um, example. Example. This example is, is good, it's giving us a lot of information. Okay, let me just get this and my subgraph in hand. Okay, so our example was we had two R, three R, R. To R, to R, to R. And we had one, two, three, four fingers or end effectors. Now we need to identify the subgraphs. And when, when we say subgraphs, we mean subgraphs going from the root to the end effector, not all possible subgraphs, which will be just pieces of this, okay? So subgraphs starting at root and 
ending at end effector f end f vector so let us try to count those okay oh this page is becoming big okay and I have a nice how many subgraphs are there starting at the root and ending at n effector we have I had the number somewhere in here oh, there are if we count you know everything we have 2 to the number of branches but because we subtract the null graph and the whole graph we have 2 to the b minus 2 okay so in our case we will have 2 to the 4 minus 2 which is 14 right we can create 14 subgraphs starting at the root and ending at end effectors and let's go, let's do those let me give you the first one and then you guys give me more okay so this will be the first one 2R3R this is one subgraph Two to the two to the, we have four branches so two to the four yeah and earlier you have written 2 to the 6? Uh, before 2 to the 4? no, this is a b is it? b, so b number of branches, sorry <laughs> b equal number of branches, yeah it's not very clear from there right? ok, number of branches so this is one, ok, let's do another one let me see what, I'm going to organize them as I have them so let me keep this one and add another one 2R 3R R R not 2 R 2R this is another subgraph with branches 1 and 2 and so on I'll go to the next page and I'll write all of them for this example so you, if you guys want to review it you will have them all okay so let's go to I guess we could call them end effect or subgraphs or something like that subgraphs all right I'm just going to hopefully with the this will be num uh, one I'm going to pick 14 of them so yeah it's going to be a while 3 4 maybe I should mark the end effectors 1, 1, 2 oh, 1, 2, not 2, 3 1 2, 1, 3, 1, 4. Ah, let me see which one I have. Next one. 1, and then I have 2 and 3. 2, 3. This will be 5. And then 1, 2, 4. 2, Four. This will be six. We are going to have a whole page full of these guys. Okay, next one. One, two, six, and uh, now we have three, four. Yeah, three, four. That's seven. And now let me see. Next one is only two. Two, eight, and next one. Uh, now I have two and three. I, 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 I say that again. 
Oh, this is three. Okay, yeah, you're right. This should be two. Thanks. Two, and now. Okay, go away. Okay. <laughs> and two, three. Two, three will be nine. And now I'll, I'm going to put it up, yes. Make sure that you guys. Okay, two, three is nine, and then two, four will be ten. Here's ten. We're almost there. It's one of those things that you don't want to do ever again. And then two, three, four. Eleven. And now the twelve will be just three. Now this is three. Twelve. Oh, this page is looking nice. Twelve first three and then three, four and four. Three, four will be thirteen. And just four will be fourteen. Shush. Okay, so here we have all the. Three, four? Eleven, eleven, sorry. Eleven, uh, oh, I didn't put, but two, three, four. Two, three, four. Okay, so here we have all possible subgraphs. So think about, you know, imagine just moving these fingers by themselves and not moving the other one, not having the other one. That subsystem may be solved for a different number of positions. It may be bigger or, you know, it may have more freedom or it may have less freedom. If it has more freedom, there is no problem. When we solve for the whole thing, that will comply. If, uh, if there is, uh, if they require less positions, then we have a problem. Okay. If the problem is one part will be overdetermined and the other will be underdetermined by our number. Okay. Well, it's kind of it kind of makes sense, right? Okay. So how do we do this? Now we have to count for each of the subgraphs, the same that we have counted. And now the only trick is get the vectors right for each of them. And there is a way of doing it automatically and that's what we are going to do. Let me just extend a little bit and and just say that go okay now we need to count to count mi for each subgraph and we'll do that in, uh, in the next page Unfortunately, we had a typo in the, in the formula of, of the counting in the paper, and that formula was copied and pasted like three times, so the, the typo carried over in all our counting formulas. So, you know, don't, don't follow the formulas there, I'll give you the right one. Are we all done? We have the notes, so you have all this. Okay, so how do we count, count that? Let's calculate, let's create this vector. Create this vector that we called bi of the n vector, which is a b times one vector, uh, b, b times one vector with ones for those end effectors that belong to the subgraph. For end effectors or branches in subgraph and zeros for the rest. Okay? Once we have that, we can calculate our e-vector, 
which are the number of edges of that particular subgraph using the end effector path matrix. Calculate E sub i and that will be equal to our end effector path matrix times the bi ee. -E. This is the number of edges in subgraph. Of course we can count them but you know it's simpler for big systems and you know it's, it's good to have it automatic so that our programs can calculate that. Remember this is the end effector and effect of okay. and oh okay this number because you know you are adding you know the value in your in your path matrix to this one you may get values which are greater than one and we only care about the ones here so we are going to use what we call the Iverson bracket here which means if the number is greater than zero it's equal to one okay so we just want to do a if n greater than zero then n equal 1, otherwise n equal 0. Ok. So we have only 1s and zeros in our vector. Alright, so now we can start applying that to our uh, graphs and I'm just going to make it with 3 and in fact it's going to be your next homework exercise is to do this for for the whole tree, okay. Iverson branch. Iverson bracket. If the number that you have in, you look component by component. If the number you have there is greater than zero, then you make it one. If it's not, if it's smaller than zero or zero, then you make it zero, okay. And what is in the bracket inside the bracket? Oh, this. Yeah. Oh, okay. This, if I roll it up, it's a greater than zero. Uh, sign greater than zero. Okay. So let us do some some of those. Uh, so let me go back to this page for a second. We are going to do number one. I have done number one, number two, and number five. So one, two and five okay so we have one with one one with two one with five and if you guys want we can do more okay we are just going to do the matrix of those three so let us calculate that subgraph one so we have the b one what well, is this is the number of subgraph and the vector we have four end effectors, right? And in this case, it's only the first end effector that belongs to the graph. So we have one, zero, zero. <laughs> I see, it retracts the page one. One, zero, zero, zero. Only the first branch belongs to the subgraph in this case, okay? And now we calculate the number of edges in, the, in this subgraph, E1. And that's equal to, let me see if I have the matrix here, no I don't. Uh, we had it in the T times 1, 0, 0, 0. It would be worth doing it once, so maybe we should do this matrix again, the end effector path matrix. Oof. Oh, we have it in our previous notes. Do you guys, did you guys copy that, the T for this graph by a chance? You have it? Can you tell me by it, Rose? One, 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 one. One? Uh, one, zero, zero, zero. Zero, one, one, one. Zero, one, zero, oh. zero. Hold on, zero. This is longer, I know. Zero, one, zero, zero. Zero, zero, one, zero. One, zero. Zero, zero, zero. 
Okay, looks good. So this we are going to multiply times one one zero zero one zero zero zero. And of course we have to get an a, a dimension which is equal to the number of edges. So we have one for the first one, one for the second, and then zero 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 zero. This is the E1 vector. <coughs> and then we'll, we'll look at the formula once we have this. Graph 2, V2, and the vector. How many end effectors are involved in the second subgraph? Now let me just go back here for a second. One and two. So one, one, zero, zero for the second one. One, one, zero, zero. And then E2. So when we do this, uh, let me just put it again. So right now you can see that we, we get a 2 here, so we have this plus this times this plus this equal 2 in the first 2, then we have 1 in the second, 1 in the third, 1 in the fourth, 0, 0. Now we have to apply the Iverson bracket and that what this does is it transforms this 2 to a 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, okay? So as yet so that we can use this vector as you know with a 1 or a 0, whether it belongs or it doesn't belong. Okay, let me see I get that, yeah. And now let me just do the subgraph 5. And then we'll just apply that to calculate the number of positions. So let me go back here, subgraph 5 has 1, 2 and 3 branches involved in the subgraph. See here? 1, 2 and 3, which means we are going to write B5 equal to 1, 2 and 3 and 4 is not there. And then when we do the same calculation we get E5 which is let me just give you the value. 3, 1, 2, 1. 3, 1, 2, 1, 1. Oh. 1, 1, 1, 0. And then we apply the bracket. 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0. Okay, so these are the vectors that we need for counting the number of, of uh, positions for each subgraph. So we will use the same formula and you know the same values for the number of structural parameters, the number of uh, joint variables, those are the same, we just need to use those values only for the edges that are involved in the process. So everything will be the same except these two vectors. apply to formula 2 and let me just give you the right version of the counting formula okay okay i had copied somewhere not here Okay. Oh, here it is. So MI, the number, maximum number of position we can reach for subgraph I will be the, this vector will be the same, which is the vector of structural variables of the edges. But now we do the dot product with EI, right? Minus the number of 
uh, extra constraints and that will multiply the one corresponding to the end effectors we have. Not all of them, but just the end effectors that we are considering. Divided by the degrees of freedom of the space in which we are moving, applied only to the end effectors that we are considering, minus the number of joint variables only for the edges that we are considering. All right. So it's just the same formula, but using the B and the and the E vectors that we have just uh, derived. Okay, so let's just do for these three and see what happens. Okay, let me put a new page here. And now we'll see what we get. So M1, I get 21 positions. Mm. A lot of positions, but think about it. I mean, this is, this is our M1, uh, 2R, 3R. This is our M1 subgraph. It's a 5R serial chain which we know it can be solved for 21 positions. That's, you know, with the traditional way of counting, you get that for serial chains. So that means, you know, this is okay. If we were only going to solve for this, let's say this finger, we will get, you know, much more freedom than solving for the whole hand. Let's do that M2. M2 gives me nine positions. Remember M2, it's already a tree graph. We have this. 2R, 3R, R, 2R. This is a simple two-fingered uh, kind of tree structure and it can be solved for nine positions by itself. Okay? And now let's count M5. M5 I got six. And M5, M5 I think, correct me if I'm wrong, I think it was the 2R, 3R, here we had an N effector, R, and then we had 2R and another 2R, right? This was 5, uh, subgraph 5. So this can be solved for 6 positions. And remember that we calculated an overall number of positions for the whole hand, which is M equal 5. Okay? So, so far everything is okay, which means, you know, if you were going to do these fingers by themselves, you could define more positions. So, they will be okay if you define less. Okay? So far it seems to indicate that it's going to work, but this is your homework number, what is it, 3 counting the midterm. I <laughs> haven't done anything in this class. Homework three, homework three, homework three. <laughs> Compute the, the number of positions for all the subgraphs and determine whether the whole graph is solva solvable or not. Compute MI for all I, determine determine solvability. Let me just give you again the criterion for for it to be solvable. Uh, so just as, as a summary, the necessary and sufficient condition for solvability of the whole graph, okay? First of all, you have to have a number of positions for the whole graph which is positive, uh, a positive value, right? And it's not infinity. So you have to have M has to belong to the positive rational numbers. It doesn't have to be an integer number. It could be two and a half positions, for instance. That, that happens, okay? 
And then for all the subgraphs, mi has to be greater than m for all mi which is which uh, which determines your chain if you have an mi which is infinity that's okay if you if you get an mi which is negative that also means that you cancel for more so that's okay too okay so just this is condition is true only in this case for all subgraphs i so if you count for a sub subgraph and you get a negative number that's okay okay that means you don't have a solvable subgraph so if you want you can put here for all solvable subgraphs i okay that's the condition Oh, oh, sorry, greater or equal, of course. If you get an equal, then that's also good. Okay. So you have to check 2 to the b minus 2. You have to create your formula 2 to the b minus 2 times. Okay. Sometimes, um, sometimes there are symmetries. Some of your subgraphs, if, if your system is symmetric, some of your subgraphs are going to give you the same number of positions because there is some symmetry. In that case, of course, you don't need to calculate all of them, only the ones that are different subgraphs, right? So this is what you have to check, but, well, let me tell you maybe what, what you can do. Uh, let me see. <laughs> so what if you have solvable subgraphs, like in this case? If solvable sub graphs exist so for instance in this case we could just solve for for this one by itself okay for this finger so if you have solvable subgraphs you can solve first for that subgraph and then knowing those values solve for the rest of the graph so you can do like a, a gradual solving of, of your graph that's a possibility uh, we can solve solve first the subgraph so see what is going to happen there are things that belong to the whole graph that are going to be determined already when we solve for a subgraph see if you look at here if we want to solve for this one for nine positions once we solve we will have determined these two first axes which are common to the whole subgraph which means we need to use those values for solving the rest of the graph okay we can solve first the subgraph and then use the values use the values to solve for the rest okay we can use those values to solve for the rest what is going to happen is we are going to need more positions in general, right? Because for instance, this one you need to solve for nine positions. Then once we have that, the rest of it will be only for x positions, right? So sometimes it's a good strategy to solve for subgraphs separately. Sometimes you want to do everything in one. In the cases that you can, then you know, those are the conditions for solvability. Okay, now we know when a graph is solvable, right? No, we don't. <laughs> there is always something else. And this is something we found out at the time we were just, you know, finishing the paper. In fact, we were adding one more example, and I don't know if it was when we submitted or in the first revision, actually. So we couldn't explore that much. But it turns out that now, if you take your graph, and we'll go back to our graph. Or let me just write it down. 
but if you take your graph okay this is your graph and now you change the root graph so you change which link you are holding fixed actually the solvability of your subgraphs will change and it turns out that you have to count those two but we think we have to we are not quite sure yet so we have seen in some cases that unless you count that it doesn't work we are not sure how much of a sufficient and necessary condition that is okay so that's something that we need to explore if let me just put this here if we change root uh, vertex then subgraphs change 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 and we need to look at those two let me give you just one example and uh, this will be part of the exercise too we need to look at those two so imagine that now we fix this one so now this is one more finger let's say and now we have this as the root 2r 3r r 2r 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 so now you know we were moving let's say like this you know and now we are fixing this and we are moving everything else okay Uh, let me let me show you one subgraph which is already I wouldn't say problematic but different from what we have seen so far let's take for instance this subgraph subgraph this one so we have here 3r r 2r Okay, let's take this subgraph. See what happens to this subgraph? It's a serial chain, but it has six revolute joints. If it has six revolute joints, it means it can reach any position in space, which is in a, within its, its volume, right? Which means when we compute the mi of this one, we are going to get infinity. We are not going to get a, 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 a positive rational number. This is this is not a problem in this case because it's not uh, over constraining. It you know what it means is that this is not going to give you any problem. This can reach any position, but you know we need to look at all of them and make sure that none of them are over constraining our linkage. So we we need to look at most. We need to look at. Changing this will be b times 2 to the b minus 2, right? So the end effector being in each of the branches. Subgraphs. And many of them, them will be symmetric. For instance, this, this, and this as changing as, an, uh, as a root graph, as a root node, those will be symmetric. So you only need to consider one because it gives you the same type of change, right? So at most is this for a completely unsymmetric graph if you have symmetries then you may be able to to reduce that subgraphs to check and uh, this is what we need to maybe take a closer look and how this reacts so this is part of let's say this is this is the same homework okay so that this will be part b of the homework will be check all uh, subgraphs changing the root vertex okay and then all of them have to be bigger than five and then tell me if all of them are bigger than five then we can finally solve this tree as a whole if some of the, if if we get one that is less than five then we have a problem because that part will be over 
determined. And I don't see I don't see that happening, but it could be. I don't know. So I'm thinking right now. Here you have a, a serial four R chain, and that it's for nine positions, so we are fine there. Uh, I'm not sure about this one. If you have this as the root and these two fingers, they may that may be uh, overdetermined. But you guys have to do it. Okay, it's your exercise. And of course, as usual, we didn't have time to, to do the review. So next day, we will just review everything and then we will be ready to, to start using this in our tricks. You will have this example that hopefully it will be solvable. I don't know. No, we just, I, I haven't worked this out. So you guys will, will be the first ones in the world in, in doing this. 